And I'm thinking that means we're live. And happy Pi Day Friday. Happy drama. And as you can see, today we're going to talk about the GIMP. <laughs> hey, I'm Dave Rush, and uh, my partner in Pi isn't here today. Uh, he's working for Andre, working ever so diligently on Sec Plus simulations. So apologies for missing that. <laughs> I am live and sound great. Many thanks, Scott, uh, from the back channel. So he's watching, he's listening, uh, and he's working on his project at the same time. He didn't want to be, uh, you know, looking down, working on his project and half paying attention and talking. So uh, he's still half paying attention, but now he can look down and you don't get to see it. So happy Friday, everybody. Hope you're all having a great day. I am. Uh, I have had a lot of fun this week getting the GIMP presentation ready to go and another presentation if we need it. So ever so quickly, and Dave Rush, I'm the senior instructor at Total Seminars. Uh, we don't do a lot of instruction uh, in the, the kind that they hired me to do, stand up for uh, uh, various classes at schools and lots of three-letter government agencies, some of which carry guns and some not so much. But this is my opportunity to work with you and to do kind of some teaching, have a little fun, shoot the breeze with everybody. We hold AMAs Monday, Wednesday, Friday at two o'clock central time, central daylight, central standard, whatever it is, it's always two o'clock. And on Fridays, we dedicate that two o'clock session from two to four to talk about Raspberry Pi and how we can use it as a learning tool to foster and continue our learning for CompTIA certifications and any place else we can find a place for them. We also do just some really fun stuff, recognizing that the Pi is a cool and neat tool in and of its own. And that's kind of what today is at least starting with. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the graphic, sorry, the GNU image manipulation program, GIMP. Uh, in a little while, we'll talk about some questions and things like that. If you would like to get in touch with me outside of the, the realm of this thing, I very much encourage that. Let me see how that works. You click this button and it says, get in touch with me here. So you can find me at Dave R at Total Sim or not both, drushtx at yahoo.com, my personal email. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just look up, uh, there's more than one Dave Rush, I'm amazed to say over on LinkedIn. But if you look for the one that's at Total Seminars, that's me. You can find me on Steam, I'm Blood Rush TX. And we're doing this experiment. We're the third week into it. One more to go. Uh, if you're new here, if you're not new here and you haven't done this yet, uh, please like our page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're just trying to check out to see if uh, what kind of reach we're getting and, and who responds to things like that. So we're not going to send you emails or anything like that. Yeah, we might. I don't know. I'm just doing what they told me to do. Tell us to like and subscribe. But I won't put the big banner up on the middle of the thing that says, don't forget to like my page and subscribe to it. <laughs> so if you got a question, post it here. We are open for any topic. Uh, our bailiwick is CompTIA stuff, A+, Net+, Security+. Uh, I'm good for just about anything technological, anything but uh, religion and politics. And of course, our focus here is the Raspberry Pi. So Let's see what you got. Let me look in here real quick before I start grabbing questions. We did that, we did that. Mike maybe uh, at least poking his eyes in on this and uh, I gave him on our back channel the, uh, the information on how to connect to the Zoom thing. Who knows, he may just poke in at all, but uh, he wanted to see just if you can really do GIMP on a Raz Pi. And as I said, I've been experimenting all week with that kind of sort of. And uh, I'm very impressed. Is it the greatest platform ever for GIMP? Obviously not, but it's pretty doggone good. And I've worked, messed with some really big files and done some editing on them and been quite successful. As usual, we got specials. Yes, it's true. And there are weekly specials. So this week's special, that's kind of weird. Yeah, oh, that'll work. Oh, I see what's going on, standby. There we go. So Mike has, through us, created a series of testing utilities, simulation bundles, all kinds of other goodies. 
and he sells them at an incredibly low price, stunningly low, embarrassingly low. Uh, and somehow the marketing department says, you know what? We can still shave some money off that and give the people who attend uh, Mike's AMAs and our pie AMA here an even better discount. So AMA specials for this week, as if the price weren't already low enough, 50% off all A plus and net plus total tester, which is our test simulation bundle, uh, or sorry, package, and then bundles of total tester and SIMs for A plus and net plus. And the SIMs are, are progressing rapidly under Scott's steady hand, but until they do, all we've got is the total tester, 50% off on that. When you check out, use the promo code STUDY2020. Excuse me, that's good through November 22nd. That's this Sunday. No, I don't know if it's midnight central time or UTC or whatever. So just do it before Sunday and uh, you on it go. And if you've got any teachers out there and you're teaching an active class in uh, any of the products that we support, an A plus, Net plus, Sec plus, a couple of the others, Contact Kathy Y at Total Sim. She has utterly blown the doors off the place uh, to provide resources for you uh, free. She's given it away if you're a teacher with an active class. Don't call up and you know, try and fool her if you're not a teacher and you don't have an active class. She knows and she checks if she doesn't, but cool bananas. All right, let's see what's appeared on the list of questions. I'm going to see if I can position this so that when I read them, it kind of looks like I'm looking at you. Oh, goodness. Man, somebody got in early. I, I don't do these questions uh, before 2 o'clock, but I do note that Elbow made it in at 1.32. So if you come in on these uh, sessions and you got questions, uh, by all means, post them. But I don't start answering the questions uh, that, don't, uh, that appear before uh, start time. So there's a 2 o'clock. Here we go. So Brendan S., good morning, Brendan. I forget where you are that it's morning for you. Yeah, thinking about it, thinking, thinking, won't come to me. But you remind me. Tolowit says, Dave will be focused on talking. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> yes, let's begin the session with abuse. I love that. <laughs> Although I have a question. How necessary is a heat sink? For an M2 NVMe drive, I've mainly just heard people say, just put it on a heat sink that came with it on your motherboard and you'll be okay, but I don't want so. Uh, I have never put a heat sink on an M2 drive, either SATA or NVMe. Uh, I have put my hands on them while they're running and they're warm, but certainly not hot. And, and every package that I've ever purchased, uh, and that's for the company, that's for my personal purposes, they don't come with a heat sink. I don't. I, I don't understand the concept unless there's something out there that I'm not aware of that requires uh, any kind of heat sinkage for an M2 drive. So, you know, unless somebody's got something out there that says I had to do it and it came with it and, you know, you're welcome to prove me wrong. But in my personal experience, never seen the need for it. I got an M2 drive really, really, really hot one time. Uh, and I was surprised that it wasn't destroyed. I installed uh, either an M2 SATA into an M2 NV, NVMe slot or the other way around. And, you know, tried to boot and it didn't boot. And couldn't find the drive and when I, in BIOS or anything like that. And, okay, something wrong with this cheap M2 drive. And I stuck my finger on it and holy Hannah, <clears throat> paid the price on that one. Uh, and of course, when I realized and looked at the manual and looked at the fact that it had two NV or two M2 slots on there, oh, I must've put it in the wrong one. Well, let's cross fingers because this one's a company purchase uh, and I popped it in the other slot and it worked. It wasn't damaged. I think it's possible that if I waited long enough, it may have gotten hot enough to be damaged. But that was uh, an IDT, uh, an ID10T error or a mechanical error. There's a nut loose behind the keyboard. So I don't think you need one. How's that? Poor Scott, so busy. Hard to leave. <laughs> All right, that's the first one in. I already had one set up, but we'll let this one go. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Brendan, seeing your shirt back there reminded me that I was disappointed when I mentioned Bob Seeger the other day and my wife said, who's that? Oh my God, where's my rope? Uh, up until 
recently for 25 years, Bob has been my number one absolute favorite, favorite artist of all time. We're from the same general area and got the whole Midwest connection thing going. Uh, I have switched loyalties now. He's now my number two um, because I'm, I'm looking at another artist now for not only his great classic rock, but for his musical genius. Bob is great. Bob is good. But uh, Steve Winwood, higher on the genius level for me. And Joe Walsh, for anybody who cares, turned 73 today. <laughs> I can't figure out a lie to call this stuff. It's cider, but I'm trying to think what the heck else looks like cider that I can say I'm drinking. Somebody will come up with it. And no, no cat wine jokes. <laughs> You're going to run out of them too soon, Tullowit, with Catman. <clears throat> Catman do, Catman wine. Yes, like and subscribe. Oh, I see Alice Ponte. Ciao, Alitza. How you doing? <clears throat> Andre, Brendan, saw that on Wick. <laughs> you guys are taking all the puns that I, I wrote down and planned to use. Hey, I had two post-its here and they vanished. Not like I need them, but I wonder what I did with them. Oh, well. If I have to get up, I'm wearing pants. Patricia Grace is here. Andre, of course, is here. Mike calls the usual, usual gallery of rogues. Okay. <laughs> Liking it, Brendan. Yeah, I know. Oh, wait. Elbow was never a huge fan, even now. Okay, so, Scott, when you get a chance, ban hammer on Elbow. If you're not a Bob fan, something wrong here. <laughs> Love Megan the Stallion. What are you talking about, man? Uh, Megan falls closer to my political bent than yours, just saying. Web Dev Bootcamp. Greetings, Deepak. If I'm, I think that's Deepak. If I'm trying to create a RAID array, any kind of RAID, do all the drives need to be of the same capacity? I hooked up drives with varying capacity and got operation not supported by the object error. Okay, so first of all, there is a kind of RAID that's not a RAID level that doesn't care how big your hard drives are. It's called JBOD, just a bunch of disks. And JBOD is really a crazy thing to do. You, in the real world, outside of a lab, you don't ever want a JBOD because all it does is appends one drive to the next. As you fill up the first, it begins to fill up the second, begins to fill up the third. If you ever lose any drive in a JBOD array, you lose all the data because the file allocation table is also spread across the entire array. And whether or not you can do JBOD or any other kind of RAID array is a function of the RAID controller that you're using. So there are some RAID controllers that can tolerate different size drives. Let's say I got a uh, 100 gigabyte drive and a 200 gigabyte drive. Yeah, I know, pretty small RAID array. And I want to mirror and stripe them. Well, they have to be the same size in a stripe, right? You're only going to get uh, 100 and 100 because you know once you run out of uh, fill the, the smallest drive, then there's nothing more to fill the next and, and stripe over here. So that's no good. Uh, and the same thing would be the case in a mirror. If I want to do a RAID 1 and I try two different size drives, well, OK, now that's where things get kind of interesting. And even in the first one, some RAID controllers will say, nope, they're different sizes we're not going to play this game. That's what you're encountering. Some RAID controllers, like the ones found on Intel motherboards with ICH9 and ICH10 chipsets, they will look at all of the drives in array and set them to be equal in size to the smallest drive that you have. And all the other space on any other drive, let's say you had to uh, a one gigabyte drive, that's a hundred gigabyte drive, and a 200 and a 300 and a 400 and you're doing some kind of array that requires four drives. Well, you're gonna get all 100 on this one. You're gonna get the first 100 of the second one, and the first 100 of the third, and the first 100 of the fourth. So you waste 200 or 100 gigabytes here, 200 gigabytes here, 300 gigabytes here. That space is completely unusable. It's hidden and buried by the RAID controller. You can't get to it through any other methods. So you're gonna get 400 total 
uh, gigs of space might be less if you're doing mirroring or might be less if you're doing whatever kind of array you're doing anything other than striping with striping you get all four. Um, but I think that's what's going on your RAID controller simply says, I can't deal with non equal size drives. And that's really a, an unusual thing you don't see that much anymore because unless you use same make and model. There's no such thing as equal size drives. They have to have exactly the same number of sectors or what will later become clusters and things like that. Now, what if you've got uh, one drive of this make and model and it's got a bad sector on it? Well, it's no longer equal to that one. And if you buy a hundred gigabyte drive from Seagate and a hundred gigabyte drive from Western Digital, they are probably not exactly the same size down to the sector level, the 4K sector. So most RAID controllers should be able to accommodate some size differential. Good question, web dev. Sorry, I super scrolled. There we go. <laughs> yeah, but Higher Love and that whole album, just not, not his best work. Musically fine. And honey, pure honey. Oh, man. Ooh, that would be wonderful. We've been cooking a lot with honey this week. I used to live about 300 miles west of Catman, too, <laughs> with the English spelling. Well done, Web Dev. That's cool. <laughs> uh, let's see. Passing time mark 212, saying I wasn't a fan, canceled out the pun in the same sentence. And, uh, Alice is talking to Scott. Can I ask him IT questions? By all means, except Alice, you know about your questions and my complete inability to answer them. You, you shocked Mike and gave him a, a week's worth of research. I also passed along the two questions that you posted here last week to him, but he either didn't get them or didn't get around to researching them. So I will add these if I can't answer them to his pile and I'll beat him up mightily. He missed my Steve Winwin pun. I didn't, I just didn't read it. Yeah, and Alice, uh, as you ask a question, Scott will answer anything you have that I can't do. <laughs> Who's also, Scott is just utterly brilliant and he hides his lamp under a, a bushel, but freaking brilliant. Everybody at Total Sin is. 214, Andre is talking to Scott. You're not supposed to be busy with other projects. He's only busy with one and it's just for you, Andre. I have the same problem Mike does, Tullowit. I never understand uh, SMS slang, like FOMO. Don't know what that means. A few of them I do. Fear of mission out. Oh, missing out, I'll bet. What's the difference between bootstrap and DHCP? Okay, I can mostly do that one. Let's start with the fact that they are, they use the same core protocol. Bootstrap is ancient and Bootstrap is simply a, a protocol that says, I don't have what I need to get started. The original Bootstrap protocol was one that would call out for a server that, <clears throat> excuse me, had a bootable operating system on it. Remember when we boot from an operating system, that operating system comes from a local storage device. In the day, it was a floppy drive, excuse me, and then we moved to a hard disk drive, and then we moved to SSDs, and we moved to flash SSDs. Need to drink. And some brilliant person said, hey, you know what? I could take a network interface card and put some code in there that makes it look and act to a computer and to an operator, to a computer, like it's a hard drive. Remember, when you're talking to a hard drive, you're talking not to the hard drive and the, the computer doesn't talk to the hard drive, it talks to the hard drive controller. So let's, and then the hard drive controller is responsible to go and get information from the boot sector and get things booted up. So some brilliant goober out there said, I'll take a network interface card and I will make it look to the computer like it's a hard drive controller. And then of course we had to build a whole bunch of other pieces. Then it had to have the ability to call out for a server that's got boot files on it. And then of course we had to develop the server so that it could hold boot files in a way that the network interface card 
could read those and pull them down and pass them into memory so that they become the operating system. That protocol to pull all that off is bootstrapping. Well, bootstrapping was morphed a little bit that says, hey, we've got an operating system now, but there are things that aren't here within the computer that we need to make it functional, like an IP address, like a DNS server, like a default gateway, like a subnet mask. And all that stuff, of course, can be manually programmed in, but hey, let's use the bootstrap protocol to call out to a server that has just these little factoids that we need in order to continue that. And that process, or, or in order to uh, pull that stuff down. So that process took the bootstrap protocol and it morphed it a little bit uh, into what became DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or whatever Mike always calls it, Dynamic Host Configuration Programming something, but it is correctly Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So closer related ones, newer and updated uh, to deal with some specific pieces of information instead of a whole uh, operating system. In Cisco parlance, they still often call or include references to bootstrapping when they're dealing with DHCP. All right, Scott, Scott or anybody else, if you think I missed anything there, fill in, but I'm fairly confident on that. I, I love that, th that you brought that up. Alice, I haven't thought about bootstrapping in you know, since we used to bootstrap. <laughs> uh, reading questions, passing 215. I went and bought the $17 backlit keyboard. I might have to go without a couple meals to bounce back. Hey, you might not uh, have to break for lunch during Mike's AMAs or this one. Alice is here. She's watching you. Well, that triggered a, a thought process in me and it's gone now. So, Alice, can you please explain the concept Inside the network, the real DHCP compete with the rogue DHCP and the fastest wins, quoting Mike. Do they randomly respond in turn? Okay. So the DHCP process in modern terms is a broadcast process. It starts out with a DHCP client sending out a broadcast message that says, attention everybody, Here's my MAC address. I'm sending this to the broadcast MAC address, 48 ones. Uh, I need a DHCP server and an assignment. Every host on the computer hears it. And in a correctly configured network, there is one DHCP uh, server included among those hosts. And it hears that. And he looks at the, uh, the protocol value in there. DHCP protocol, the, the, the six, somebody help me out with the protocol number, though it doesn't matter. He hears it and he says, I am a DHCP server and I can offer you an IP address. And the client calls back in broadcast because he doesn't have an IP address yet. So he can't send to and from he can, uh, an IP address. He can't make an IP packet. So he responds, yes, I would like that assignment, please. And the server responds back with an acknowledgement and says, I acknowledge that you would like me to give you one and here is an IP address for you and whatever other information is in the DHCP server, subnet mask, a preferred DNS server or multiples, a default gateway and so forth. And that's it for the communication. The client doesn't call back and say, thanks a lot, dude, that was awesome. Uh, we just did the Dora. We did the discover. Hey, is there a DHCP server? An offer. Yes, I'm one. I can help. Respond. Great. Help me out and acknowledge. Okay, here's the help you want. Here's the IP address. So how about I'm a bad guy and I want to gather some information from you. Maybe it's something simple as a, a MAC address. Uh, maybe I want to get you hooked up to my network so I can uh, do some phishing effectively uh, and get some login credentials from you. So Dave the hacker puts online here a DHCP server. Maybe I'm just you know sitting in my computer. I'm a bad guy in the company. Nobody knows it. And I create a DHCP server on my computer. 
So the next time somebody sends out a DHCP discover, the first DHCP server that hears it and responds to it does. So I can't guarantee that my machine is going to respond to that request, but I can guarantee that it's going to respond to some sometime. And this is where it gets kind of fun. So the two start negotiating, that host and my machine, he's responded and he gives an IP address. My machine gives out an IP address that's different than the IP address of the rest of the corporate network. Everybody else is on 192.168.1.0 and I'm on 192.168.10.0. So I pass out a 10.50 address to this client. Now I've also got to have set up on my machine uh, some other fake gear so that they will connect with me. They won't be able to connect with anybody else on the network because they're on a different network address. My computer is the only one that they'll be able to see. And eventually they're gonna figure out they're having a problem, but now they go to a website or I have my machine send them a prompt for a network login. Maybe it's a fake domain login screen or something like that. Uh, and I can gather from that uh, a password and uh, a login name and whatever other I can fool that into. I can make a really sophisticated system that might even look a lot and act a lot like the corporate network. So I can gather a whole bunch of stuff and save it on a flash drive before they usher me out the door. So that's a rogue DHCP server. It's one that's added. It's not approved. It's not standard. It's not part of the network. And it's designed to do something malicious. Maybe I'm really smart. I only turn it on during certain times of day when it's tough to detect me. A uh, really cool utility out there called DHCP Mon. You can uh, Google it and download it and watch all the DHCP traffic that goes on on the network. And you can do that, of course, because it's broadcast traffic. So you will see all of the DORA activity. It's all broadcast. Hope that helps, Alice. That's two tough ones. That's all you get. <laughs> okay. FOMO, Phoebe, Phoebe, Bobby, Fluby, mission out. Boy, you scared me there, Tullowit, when you said missionary. We already talked about the priesthood in Mike's AMA. We're not going to do missionaries. I'm a millennial. <laughs> That's a song, Brendan. I'm a millennial, and I don't know what that means. Yeah, I knew she would, Scott. Back channel. <laughs> so what are the steps you take to find a rogue DHCP? Use DHCP Mon. Use Wireshark. Uh, and that won't help you there. Some kind of data sniffer that's watching for this broadcast response. And what you have to do is know and register the MAC addresses of the approved DHCP server. And then you can use your monitoring software to look for DHCP servers that respond with a different MAC address. That would be the quickest, easiest one that I can come up with. Web dev, thank you. Thank you for answering both my follow up. My pleasure. Hope they were right. <laughs> Passing 217, Alice, why with IF config, you see the network ID of the rogue DHCP and not the real one. Is it always like that? Uh, that sounds like you got something situation specific. Why do you see the network ID of the rogue DHCP and not the real one? I, I would need to know more about the configuration. You should be able to see them both. Um, with IF, oh, no, no, no. Okay, with IF config, the only one that you're going to see is the one that you negotiated with. In fact, you shouldn't even see that. After you've negotiated with it, you don't need to see the DHCP server anymore. So I'm, I'm you're, you're throwing me on that one, Alice. Uh, see if you can uh, fill that out a little more for me. Sorry about that. More 217, I love these pie days. So do I, better than Hollywood Nights. There is nothing better than Hollywood Nights. By the way, if you ever encounter the movie Hollywood Nights, it has nothing to do with Seeger. They don't even use the theme song and it sucks. Kind of a 70s, 80s angst, teen angst type movie. Brendan, is CSMACD only on hubs or do collisions occur within uh, modem ethernet with switches? Okay, CSMACD, Carrier sense multiple access with collision detection happens anytime we use a true, is that the right word? Something that's true, modern, not modem, thank you. 
doesn't matter. Modern, yeah. That's my font. It's all squoze up together. It does look like both. Uh, on, a, on something that looks and acts like a true linear bus system. A true linear bus system uses that. The old coax connection systems, hubs used that because they were really just uh, kind of an internalized linear bus with taps that came out uh, to the front of the box. Uh, when switches came out, that collision domain went away. Uh, the earliest switches were literal switches. You had data coming into a port on a switch here and data coming into a port on a switch here. And those two ports needed to communicate, excuse me, with one another. And so internally, the switch would actually physically connect those two ports, allow the packet or the, the frame to pass and then disconnect them. And so it was possible at that point that if both of the hosts attached to the ports were trying to transmit simultaneously, a collision could occur. occur. But those kind of switches don't exist anymore. Today we use uh, what are called uh, the, the store and forward switches. So a store and forward switch says, I will accept a frame from this host and I'll put it in memory in here and I'll accept frames from this one and put it in memory here. So they're always isolated from each other and from every other port on the switch. And then internally the, the switch will move the data out of this memory buffer and uh, send it out that port. So the only time a collision can occur on a modern switch or a modem switch, I was thinking ethernet modems or some of the kind of things that could theoretically uh, collide uh, is if the switch port starts sending an outbound frame to a host at the same time that the host would send an inbound frame to that same port. So collisions, not a thing of the past, but so much more rare. Used to be the old days, uh, you could hook up a maximum of 30 stations on a CSMA CD media. And that was the point at statistically which there would be enough collisions that traffic throughput would start to go down in a measurable way. Now we start talking about 1024 connections before there are so many switch port to host collisions. All right, hope that helps. <laughs> we catch your puns, I just don't read them all. And I especially don't read the low hanging fruit ones, they're way too easy. You give me some obscure uh, Seeger song like, uh, oh, Paint This Town, that's not the right thing, but you know, don't give me his, his pop 40 stuff. No, anytime, Alice, keep on asking. You're a lot of fun here. 1433, good shape on time. What kind of side are you drinking? It's a uh, gala. See, I actually know the answer to that one. It's a, a gala mix, which means it probably has 2% gala apple juice in it, and then some reconstituted cat pee wine. <laughs> Passing 220 elbow, maybe because mine or so. No, stop. All right. Both of you, stop self-deprecating. I am the only self-deprecator here. Oh, we got tonight so, so, so low hanging. Shame. Sorry, I just super scrolled. Here, I'm back. Rolling, rolling, rolling. 221, you contribute to the tech conversation. Yes, he certainly does. <clears throat> she does. Fire inside. I'm embarrassed. Waiting for the Fire Lake reference. Oh, there you go. Live inside my heart. Okay, good. I like putting up ones like Bob because he has such a body of work. Everybody can work from that. <laughs> it's a drama. Dave Rush, ask me anything. So keep those questions coming. You betcha. DCP port. Thank you. 6768. I, I had it in my head 63 for foolish reasons. Four forty-three. No, forty-two. You goober. <laughs> oh goodness! Pun, 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 pun. 
Pun, 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 pun. The wonderful thing about puns. Movie avoiding questions were the answers, four, four, three. But it's such a secure answer. Ah, my pun. Oh, good Lord. A Billy Eilish reference, seriously? <laughs> He's got a weird style. Which he, Billy? <laughs> yes, I know Billy is not a Billy. Uh, you're very welcome, Alice. Happy to have helped in some minuscule way. 228, anyone know whether using silicon power drives are a, is a, are, is a terrible idea? I've only ever used one before with my friend's PC build. It still doesn't work, so I'm not sure if they're any good. I have no personal experience with them. Um, if it doesn't say Western Digital, I'm probably not playing. If we're talking SSDs, it, it's got to say Samsung. In a crunch, I'll play Seagate and everything else for hard drives and SSDs. I'm terrified. I looked up some other pictures. Seems to be female. Yes. Billy is not a Billy. She's a Billy. <laughs> Not reading it, just laughing at it. What's that DHCP sniffing software? I, I think it's DHCP Mon. Let me see what I've got it here on this machine. No, let me see if I put it in my cool tools. I have a cool tool like Mike does. It's his plus the ones that I add to it. Looking, looking, stand by. One moment, please, in the words of Mike. Uh, desktop. Show me, hey, look at that, Net Plus Cool Tools. DH, there it is, it's called DHCP Find, one word. Wow, I found it. Uh, one really interesting thing about that, when you're using it, your machine will be useless for anything else. So while it's running, uh, it can't get DHCP, it can't uh, respond to DHCP, it can't watch itself. Uh, and if I remember right, it's been a while since I've run that, um, it may kill all of your other IP functions. So use it to do your sniffing and then close it down. Experiment at will. I know it won't work if your machine uh, is playing DHCP in any fashion, if it's got a DHCP server or a DHCP uh, client on there. And my guess is that's just because uh, they both have a 67-68 port protocol conflict. Two thirty, catching up. What time is it? Thirty-eight. Okay, I'm only eight minutes behind. That's all right. Uh, GIMP today is very quick, quick enough that I've got a backup program if we need it. <clears throat> yeah, everybody should copy this whole thread all the time just to pull Alice's questions out there. Great things. If I can't answer them, uh, then it's good research for you. I don't see myself as fuzzy Tullowit and I, you know, I go out to YouTube and then I come back on a separate channel. So don't think that my feed is the problem again, because the, the look back that I'm seeing, I might be a little bit fuzzy just because of the camera, but uh, nothing that should be oriented to, uh, rates or anything like that. Good. Um, of little interest to anybody but myself, AT&T has taken over my neighborhood as far as providing ISP services. There's a few of us uh, dinosaurs that are left running Comcast. Uh, I don't want AT&T service at my house. No good reason, no bad reason. It's just I've I, I lock into things, okay? I've been a Comcast customer since I've been here 20 some odd years in this house and I don't wanna change. And I have the slowest service almost that Comcast offers. Uh, it's 70 megabit up and four or five down, something ridiculous like that. I did a speed test on it two days ago and I got 90 megabits up. However, they are having a sale because AT&T is just taking over my neighborhood. So they, uh, sent me an email or contacted me somehow. My wife got the info and said, hey, we're offering a gigabit for 
20 bucks more a month than you're paying right now. Okay, well, that's a no brainer. I'll do that. And then the missus called them up to put it together yesterday. And they uh, ultimately charged me after everything, not including the taxes and fees and crap, uh, gigabit service for five bucks more than I'm paying now. So tomorrow I'm going to the Comcast Xfinity store and trade my old Doxus Dosis modem for my new gigabit one. And I'll be probably out for the whole dang weekend while I make it work because I hate Comcast, but when they work, they work. <laughs> it ain't the beard. It's such a fuzzy beard. This one you negotiate with. This is the answer I needed. Okay. Yeah, I hope that helps. Oh, elbow that's thin, still the same. I was going to nick this. Not off, but trim it. Yes, he's a fuzzy guy. Well, my slippers are fuzzy. That's got to count. Uh, sadly, it's about the best webcam you can get these days. It's the... Uh, Logitech 920S, so it's not the four gig one, but it's good. You should see the little crappy one I bought at a flea market two weeks ago. I'll show you later. You've been around long enough now. 232. Andre, rather spend Dudley's bucks and get a webcam for the giveaway. <laughs> I'm working on some giveaway ideas. I got to get Dudley to bless it, but. Uh, if, if, if this blessing comes through, I got fun stuff. Hey, we're still debating about whether or not we're going to do a show uh, a week from today here in the U.S. Uh, that's the day after Thanksgiving. It's a huge uh, day that lots of people take off. I'm sure many of you in the States are. Uh, so we're debating uh, a short show, no show, a usual show. Michael will do an announcement on Monday or Wednesday with our decision. So uh, my feeling, I'm not going anywhere. We got no family or anything like that coming up. So I'm willing to shoot the whole two hours. So the world holds its collective breath. And Scott has posted Mike's cool tools up there. Uh, that DHCP find may be in there. You can buy your own modem. Oh, I'm getting near the end. Well, I must have super scrolled. There's no way I can be at the end. <laughs> yeah, autumn closing in, I said. All right, going back to the 230s. Reading questions. Rather spend Dudley's money. Okay, that's where we're caught up. Secretly, Scott's talking to Alice. I'll let that go. The most moral man he knows. <laughs> Scott definitely qualifies as that. Hey, David Zentera. Ooh, yes, that's right. Back in those days, Bridges were still a thing. They didn't filter traffic. Uh, collisions were possible across a bridge. Man, you're, you're you're bringing up my nostalgia thing. Oh, de meow. There's a shirt. I like that one. <laughs> Jason doesn't. Web dev, switched from my boot option from legacy to Eufy, and the Dell laptop says boot device not found. Why would that be? I got terrified, switched back to legacy, and relieved to find I didn't break the PC. My offhand guess goes this way. When you engage uh, Eufy and use it to replace legacy, there's a setting in Eufy called Secure Boot. And since you didn't set up your previous OS under Secure Boot, it probably won't Secure Boot here. I would try to go back to Eufy and then go into the Eufy BIOS and disable Secure Boot. You, it's it can be a bit of a process. You can't just disable. You also have to, excuse me, delete the secure boot keys. It's a terrifying thing to do. Uh, so do a little research on it, but I will bet you nine donuts to a buck that that's the problem. It's a secure boot or issue. I'm not going to read the same question twice and answer it. How's that? <laughs> can you have signal collisions with UTP cables since they have a separate transmit receive channel? Probably not. In fact, no, on gigabit, in all theory, because they are separate channels, you cannot have collisions. So when you transmit up, it goes into the, to the transmit buffer or into the, the receive buffer of the switch. And likewise, it goes out the transmit on the receive lines of the host. So yeah, 
That's why we don't talk about collision domains anymore. We talk about broadcast domains. Used to be the broadcast domain and the collision domain were the same, but not so much no more. Wait, says WebDev Bootcamp. Why is there a copy of the same question? Didn't touch anything. Oh, probably just an accidental enter. I'm not going to report you to YouTube. Don't worry about it. <laughs> or I might. Scott, report WebDev Bootcamp to YouTube. He double posted. I'm considering, says Elbow at 238, trying a silicon power NVMe drive. It would be my first. Well, it would be your second because you said you used the one on your friend's machine and you're not sure if it's reliable. So try it and report back here to everyone. Dave, please share your cool tools file. I, uh, Scott posted the, uh, the mic cool tools file. And if, if DHCP find isn't in there, use your favorite search engine, Goog or mine, DuckDuckGo or Mike's, what's he use front page, something like that. And just look up dhcpfind.exe or .zip, you'll find it. Alice, you always use that icon and I never look up what it is, What uh, that emoji, what is that? 238, Andre WebDev is uh, talking to WebDev, Comcast, our regional cable ISP. Oh, I thought they were national. I figured everybody knew Comcast. WebDev Bootcamp talks to Tullowitz. Dr. Quinn, nice to see you, always fun. I always copy it, and that's why I requested of Scott Jernigan to please not disable the chat after the end of the live stream. All right, so we, we have a theory about that. Uh, it looks like the chat continues to operate for five minutes after we kill the feed. We have to kill the feed at two o'clock or you know, we're gonna run a couple minutes late, but as soon as you see the big goodbye and our screen stops, it appears to function for five more minutes. Uh, and I'll tell you what I'll do today uh, is once we do the big goodbye, I will keep my feed running for five minutes. Michael's gonna kill it. Uh, whenever we do the goodbye, nothing you can do that, but uh, we'll call this an experiment and I'll, I'll keep sending for five minutes to the shutoff feed and we'll see if it continues to function. Elbow, I struggle far more with press view than deja vu. Sorry, deja vu, deja vu, that's uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, so different pun. I don't have that shirt up today. I don't know, but pretty sure all my matrices and their determinants are fine. <laughs> I love when we use tech words. Total sim cool tools, post it again. Yeah, uh, Scott has posted, if you're not finding it at 240, the link to Mike's cool tools, www.totalsem.com, whack cool tools, one word. Dave Rush, at and I'm sorry, and I'm right there with you, I'm not a fan. Yeah, you know. Some people like them, some people don't. I got my reasons. They're not good, they're not bad. They are just reasons. Hey, act own asterisk. I know there's more to that thought than meets the eye. But I don't know what it is. Black Pie Day, oh yeah. Funny, you should mention that. How are we doing here, 48? I'm gonna answer a question for two more minutes. I'm gonna talk about a couple of quickie things, but I'll do one right now. I got an email today from Udemy, seven day Black Friday sale. Um, lowest price on everything is 10 bucks and you know, it's a sale. So not everything is on sale, but I looked at uh, all of the total SEM courses, uh, Net Plus, both A pluses, Sec Plus, and they run from 10 bucks to 14 bucks. I thought it was really interesting that core one and core two had different sale prices. One was 10, I think the other was 12 or something like that. But uh, all of our courses are on good sales right now. There's lots of course of other good sales. Scott and Tullowit and I, and she's not here, Patricia Grace uh, are all enrolled in a uh, Python master class. That one's on sale today. So check it out. Yeah, I know. So this, that was our, our dilemma, Tullowit. Will people go physically shopping on Black Friday or will they kill, take a couple hours out of their life uh, from online shopping and check in here? And, you know, we don't have a, a strong feel for that. My feel is this class is so popular, they won't even shop. They'll just come here and then maybe shop afterward. But the world holds its collective breath on that. 
Patricia is here. Okay, I missed the I missed her name. Sorry about that. Hi, Patricia. What are some good places to pick up used PC or peripherals that I could potentially repair? Do people ever take them into the Goodwill? Absolutely, they take them into Goodwill. And in fact, uh, Goodwill has an auction site. It's called shopgoodwill.com. Major cities like ours, Houston, uh, there's a Goodwill that's dedicated to nothing but computers. And what they do is they do what you want to do. People bring in stuff and they assemble computers and sell them cheaply to people who need them. Uh, for me, if I'm looking for computer parts uh, in the used world or in the cheap world, you're going to find me on Craigslist and eBay. Uh, and then uh, all the usual sites, Newegg and Micro Center, they all have used and refurbed. Those are good places to look. Pawn shops. Anybody else have any suggestions? Throw them in. I have a list of 17 suggestions from one of the forums that I moderate where people ask this question all the time and it, I have it kind of posted as an FAQ. Here's 17 things, thrift shops, not just Goodwill, of course, plenty of other thrift shops out there. 244, Brenda and I doubt Goodwill would accept them because they wouldn't know what they are. Yep, they do, they absolutely do. I have bought computer stuff off of their online stuff. And the way they do their online, it's not a, a central clearinghouse. Every Goodwill that wants to participate, they bring in stuff, they try to sell it, or maybe they don't. Maybe they realize they're going to get more money uh, by auctioning it directly. And then they use this corporate auction site that's run by Goodwill for them to sell their goods. Scott and I have both bought stuff off of them. Scott bought a uh, an auto harp one time. So did I. We both bought auto harps. And we used them, and we flipped them. <laughs> Recycle, points out Scott, very good. You went full silicon power, never go full silicon power. They've gone to plaid. Okay, cool, Scott, thanks. Roadkill.net, more silicon power stuff, two and a half inch SSDs, out of my realm. Don't... Hey, nice tie cigar, nice to see you here. Hi, I installed real VNC on my Cali Pi 4 last week. However, when connected, the display is black apart from command line prompt. I read the screen. Uh, yeah, so Alice says the same thing. She got hers working after screen resolution issues. Uh, I have my Cali box direct connected when I set it up to a 1920 by 1080 uh, screen and it worked natively. Uh, so I know that that's a valid resolution. Try that in resolutions. Uh, try 720 as a res. Uh, also, if you're... Yeah, you're part of the uh, the Discord, the unofficial Total Seminars Mike Myers Discord that Jose Braden set up. And Alice Potsy just posted a, uh, a link on how she got type VNC to work correctly, uh, modifying a config file. And she did that in the last day. So Scott's probably going to post the uh, link to the Discord server. Go and check that out. That may be of some help. I'm going to bring my Cali box up a little later today uh, and do one or two things with it. Hey, all right. Uh, I'm going to catch up on questions here in a little bit. Let me uh, try to remember that I finished off at time mark 246 and dump into some notes here ever so quickly. Just a couple quickie things to talk about. Uh, where we're going today. That's a, a nice thing to do. And where we were last week. So last week, we installed Kali Linux on a Raspberry Pi 4, which is a very simple process. Download it, unzip it, and image it to a, an SD card, a micro SD card, and then boot up your Pi from it. It works. A little bit of configuration, set up your Wi-Fi, uh, decide whether or not you're going to use DHCP or static. The trick is getting, as No, uh, no Cigar points out, getting a good working uh, VNC on it. We've gone through a number of iterations. If you watch my show last week, you'll see the approach that I used. It's not the only one, but it's the only one that I found successful up until what Alice has done. I kind of dropped it after that. I had new fish to fry for this week. So this week, we're going to install GIMP on a Raspberry Pi. GIMP, the GNU, or new if you want to pronounce it that way, image manipulation program. 
Uh, it's kind of a, let's call it a, a cheap Linux competitor to Photoshop. It's not as good, but it's good. And, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper because it's free. One of the interesting things I found out about it as I looked into its history, I'll tell you a little bit about that later, is it's called The GIMP. We all call it GIMP. I'll continue to call it GIMP, but its official name is The GIMP, and it's from the character in Pulp Fiction. So I'll let you look that up. That was the uh, character that I had up on the screen when you first, uh, when I first started the stream. So not going any more into that. You. <laughs> you do with it what you will. So, okay, kind of a cool competitor to uh, Photoshop. And like Photoshop, there are plugins for it. It's a good out of the box photo editor, touch up box, image creator, but there's so much more that can be done with it. So there's plugins. And that's what makes today's episode really interesting. To install GIMP is a simple apt-get. Boom, apt-get apt -get install GIMP and you're up and running, ready to go. GIMP is available on three platforms. It's available on Windows, it's available on Mac, and it's available on Linux platforms, including the two major subcategories of Linux, x86-based Linux and ARM-based Linux, which of course we use on Raspberry Pis. And how you install plugins on those different platforms differs. So I'm going to spend the, the interesting part of this, how to do that. So that's going to be the fun part. Uh, I should also note that the current version of GIMP is version 2.10.22. That's current on all the Linux flavors, including ARM-based Linux and Windows. They are not current yet on Mac. Their website says they're working on it. Check out GIMP.org for information. They're still on 210.14, not 210.22, but they say that they're working on it. So, you know, that's Mac. Why would anybody want to do anything on a Mac? Anyway. <laughs> News of the week. I did the Udemy thing. Uh, I got a long thing here that's not worth it. Let me shorten this thing up. I got like a nine paragraph thing that I was going to read. I'm, I'm basically going to post this as an editorial somewhere. Um, let me share a quick thought with you. We'll call this news of the week. I don't have anything project-wise that was marvelously exciting, marvelously. But it, something dawned on me, especially between last week's project and this week's project. And it goes like this. I get it why some people dislike Linux. And it's for that opposite reason that they like Macs and Windows. And in a single word, if we could describe the reason... I, I chose the word fiddly, and it goes something like this. If you're a Windows user, it's all you ever knew about, it's all you ever cared about, what you grew up on, and you don't have any interest in learning anything else, that's cool. And because it has this marvelous benefit, when there's a piece of software that you want to run, that you don't have yet, you go get it, you install it, typically using the installer that came with the program, but if not, Windows has an installer, and it works. And so that's awesome. Then you don't have to need to know the guts of what's going on inside of the computer. You, it's like Drano. You pour it in and it works. And the same is generally true for Macs. Okay? But with Linux, while there are certainly some programs that work like that, there's a lot more fiddliness that you have to do with many programs. So with Kali, I worked for, what, 18, 20 hours to get a workable VNC with Kali. With today's project, uh, GIMP, I worked for two evenings worth. There's about 10 hours in there. I start after dinner and then I keep working until I've had enough or until I get success. Uh, and that success includes, not only does it work, I gotta be able to present it in a way that everybody can follow along quickly and easily. And there are people who have no interest in that. For me, that is pure joy. I love to fiddle with this stuff. I hope you do too. But one of the, the goals of this project is for me to be able to present to you something that required a lot of fiddling on somebody's part. But by the time we get it distilled down to presenting it, all you got to do is follow Dave's steps. And 
you're up and you're running. And hopefully along the way in those steps, you will have learned something that says, if I wanna go above and beyond, I've got some tools and knowledge and information to do so. All right. That's a seven minute presentation that I wrote. <laughs> Where are we at on the hour? Couple questions and then we're gonna get right into the project. Reading questions. Oh, elbow left. He went to lunch, I'll bet. We've been talking for several minutes after the stream. Okay, we're still, still talking about the praying hands. Now I can see it. Thank you. Got it. <clears throat> My pleasure, Brendan. Axel, I was just saying with Comcast, you should check to see if they will charge you a rental fee for your modem. They do charge me a rental fee for my modem. I negotiated it. Uh, it's two bucks a month. I'm willing to pay for that. I can go out and buy uh, a good high-speed modem for between 100 and 200, but at two bucks a month, that's good for four years, and I would have upgraded in four years anyway, so I'm sticking with their rental. <laughs> yeah, we had some fun with those auto harps. My tuner that we had to purchase for one of the auto harps is still sitting on my desk at the office. 252, and they say the inside of a switch can be similar to a star bus technology. What does that mean? Okay, so that is a conceptual. In the beginning, there was a wire and we used to have to physically tap into that wire with a long tap and some electronics to connect to a host, a server, a client, a printer, whatever. And somebody came up with the brilliant, well, at the same time, there was a competitive networking technology called ArcNet. And ArcNet was a star wired topology. It was a box that had wires coming out of ports on the front. And if you look down on that box, from 30,000 feet, the wires kind of look like this, like rays radiating out, radiating out from a star. So we call that star wired. And somebody said, that's really convenient. That's how telephone offices and, and telephone closets are wired. There's a single connection point and wires radiate all over the place to phones and computers and so forth. Let's do that with ethernet. So electronically speaking, this isn't physical. They said, let's take this long wire that could be up to 500 meters in length, or there was a different one that topped out at 185 meters. And let's electronically shrink that down so that it could fit into a box. And then using electronics, we will bring those tap points on that electronic wire out to ports on the front. So now it looks like a star wired hub system, hub and spoke, except electrically speaking, especially in the early days of switches and hubs, uh, it still operated like a true linear bus. And so we call it a star wired bus. It's really more about how it looks than how it operates, at least back then. Scott or Dave, my guess is Scott will have answered this, but Jason Helms at 252 on Udemy, if you buy a course, and a new course comes out, does it update or you gotta buy the new one? Uh, I don't know of any that auto update. You usually gotta buy the new one. It's like a book, right? When you buy a book, uh, the information in there is only valid for so long and you don't get a free replacement book when that information comes out of date, you gotta go buy a new one. And it's the same uh, with Udemy courses. It's certainly the same with our Udemy courses. So people call us all the time. I, I get messages all the time. I moderate our Udemy forums. Uh, somebody from the 901 class, in fact, recently from an 80X class, hey, you know, where's my update to the 1002? No, it doesn't work that. That, that course became obsolete six years ago. Uh, and there's, it, your, your update is the fact that Udemy sells courses on sale for 10 bucks instead of 94, 194, 500, or whatever they choose to charge. They set the pricing. We don't. And so it's very cheap to get that update if you hang out for a sale. Don't tell our marketing department I'm pushing that. Don't tell Scott I mentioned that. Devices are connected and start configuring. Thank you, Andre. Unofficial Total Seminars Discord channel. There you go. So Scott posted our Discord channel at 253. We tend to hang out there 
uh, after the show here. So I'll hang out here for an extra five minutes uh, and then I'll go get cleaned up a little bit into something a little bit more comfortable. And then I will join the Discord forum. Scott will walk his leaky dog and do his McGraw Hill meeting and then he usually pops in. Sometimes Mike does on Fridays. <clears throat> Reading questions, bring out the GIMP, says Scott. Very close here. It's 05, a couple more seconds just to check questions. <clears throat> By the way, for all of, uh, Scott's a wonderful guy. He's the most honest guy you'll ever know. He's the most moral guy you'll ever know. He is one of the hardest working guys. I cannot extol his virtues enough. He only has one flaw and that's his politics, but <clears throat> uh, here's where he's going to lie to you today. I mean, he's kind of implied it already, but I'm going to out him. I like GIMP. Probably because I'm not good at Photoshop and I'm not even that good at GIMP. Scott is a Photoshop fan by comparison. So for all the positive things that he's going to say about GIMP, he likes Photoshop better. <laughs> oh, couldn't stand another hour of daylight. <laughs> I don't see many who are in the way of questions. Lots of people talking to each other and throwing out one-liners and comments. Jason's talking, answered the same question I do. In a call with Dudley, okay. Gotta be good. All right, so Scott's not working the backup. I'm all alone, don't, don't hammer me too hard. <clears throat> I've never watched Pulp Fiction. <laughs> you know, there are some people who should not watch Pulp Fiction. I don't know enough about you, Alice. I've seen it once or twice, the first time because you have to, and the other time because I was with people who love it and had to watch it and I was there, okay, fine. But I'm not sure that it's my favorite genre of movies. Agree with you, Connor. Linux is great. And thanks for uh, the back and forth email that we had today. <laughs> I got a back channel. Um, Michael Smyer, I think is surprised that anybody hasn't, or anybody in particular, has not watched Pulp Fiction. Nice one. I'll check back on Discord. Been there in a little while. OK. Yeah, be there in a while. <clears throat> Linux Plus. Yeah, I know. Mike has put the kibosh on a Linux Plus class. Um, he has kind of corporate direction on. <clears throat> Sorry, if you can hear that beeping in the background, uh, we're having brownouts here for the last couple of days, and that's the UPS on the Mrs. Uh, computer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And once it trips, even though it's it solved the brownout problem, the brownout problem is gone, it beeps for one solid minute. There's nothing I can do with it, so I apologize. If Scott was here, I'd mute my mic and let him talk, but that ship has sailed, so... Reading questions, reading comments. I will have to send Dave some Aloha shirts. <laughs> of course I like Jimmy Buffett. Actually, Jimmy Buffett is the very first concert that I went to when I moved to Houston. Oh, it makes me a jolly good fellow. I like Gimp. See you there, yes. Hey, I made it to the end. I am caught up on questions. So let me highlight this at 308, bump that. We're gonna talk about GIMP, which means I gotta go kind of sorted to notes. So GIMP, quick history. As with everything cool that came out and became free, this was from a couple of grad students uh, doing a summer project at Cal State Berkeley. Back in 95, they worked on it. They released it in 96. They gave it a name before they knew what the project was going to be or be called. Uh, and they picked a character from Pulp Fiction who wasn't there very long. He's a very brief character and he's a very horrible, scary, terrible, frightening character. Uh, and he didn't have a name. He was just the Gimp. He was actually played by a notable actor. And, uh, you know, you go look it up and find the pictures and everything. I'm going to describe it. So now that they've decided to name this product the Gimp, now they had to come up with what it stands for. And they came up with general image manipulation program. That's what they wanted to do. That was the nature of the project was to create some kind of image editor. 
And then later when they released it, uh, and a little bit after that, they said, you know what, we're gonna make this uh, part of this new consortium, news upon there, GNU, because there was this group of developers who were sort of developing the whole uh, open source concept. And a whole bunch of these folks got together, these developers who were each developing a different, what would ultimately become a core program in the Linux universe. Let's call it the Linux verse. Uh, these guys were members of that consortium and they called that the GNU. And somebody will know what that stands for. I'm not gonna guess wrongly. And so this became part of that suite of offerings. And so they changed general image manipulation program to GNU IMP. So neat history. So what is it? Well, it's a graphics editor. And more specifically, it's a raster graphics editor. There are two kinds of graphics in the world. If you don't already know, there are raster graphics and there are vector graphics. Raster graphics are made up of pixels. Yeah, kind of sort of so are vector, but they're a little bit different. Raster graphics are like a drawing or like a painting. If you zoom in close enough, you see the spots of paint are separated by tiny little gaps. And you zoom in closer and pretty soon you get nothing but gap or pretty soon you get nothing but a pixel. That's a particularly notable in lithographs or in uh, pencil or charcoal drawings or things like that. So that's the same issue with raster graphics. You take a, a photograph, that's raster. If you zoom in on that photograph enough, it's no longer a photograph. It's just a, a bunch of uh, mashed up together or not so much together pixels. Whereas vector graphics are defined by mathematics. Everything that you do, every line, every curve, every fill in is defined by a mathematical formula. And as you zoom in on these things, the math accommodates the zoom and it fills in and stretches. And so the image always looks high resolution or whatever resolution it was defined to be. Adobe has a raster editor and a vector editor. Photoshop is their raster editor and Illustrator is their vector ed editor. Well, GIMP is just a pure raster. It's not just an editor. Uh, it's a retoucher, it's an editor. Somehow there's a distinction between those two things uh, that I'm not clear on as I did my research this week. Uh, it's an image creator, I am clear on that. It's got the ability to make boxes and circles and complex shapes and fills and colons and things like that. So it's really cool. Its history goes something like, it got worked on for a couple of years and then it got dropped and then it got picked up by other people and worked on for a few years. Then it got dropped for a long time. There was a, a big break after 2008. And then it got worked on sporadically through 2018. And then in 2018, most developments stopped. And then suddenly late 19, early 2020, uh, somebody grabbed the reins and said, man, we got to get this product updated. Linux has been updated and Adobe's updated. They got some cool things we can incorporate into there. So over the last year, there have been four major releases that have been publicly released. And I just saw this month on, uh, or maybe last month, 10.6, uh, I think, 10.8, something like that, uh, a, a new beta release came out. So somebody's at the helm running this thing full guns. And, and I haven't used GIMP in a little while, since around 18 when they stopped developing. And just before we uh, closed down the office, I, I downloaded the current copy of GIMP on my Windows machine at the office and said, holy Hannah, this is, this is better. It's stable. It's got lots of cool new tools. Um, and so I'm back in GIMP again. I really like this stuff. GIMP, as good as it is, is like the early days of Linux. It's great once you get to know its idiosyncrasies. Same with uh, Photoshop, it's, it, there's, it's a learning curve. You can't just start a Photoshop without A, some artistic skills and B, some Photoshop skills. So GIMP is the same way, it's good out of the box functionality. It's pretty easy to figure out if you have any kind of image editing experience. 
But if not, there's a bit of a learning curve and there's a billion online tutorials and freebies that show you that. So it's a little wild west, but it's not bad. It's available for all the current Debian libraries, a couple non-Debians and ARM libraries like Pi. I tested this on a 3B with one gig. I tested it with a 4B with two gigs. They run about the same, but what I've discovered is the plugins run faster on four. So we're gonna do, is, do ours on a four. I'm gonna do it on a four with two gig that I've never installed it on. So it's gonna be fresh. It's the, uh, the, four, uh, the 4B that we use for uh, our Plex and our Kodi server experiments. So with no further ado, Let's do an install. This isn't too long. Stand by, setting up the, which server is that on? PlexPy, this one. I know you can't see it yet. By the way, you, you guys know that I've been here a long time. Uh, sometimes I get buzzing along and I haven't noticed that I'm not sharing with you. So I'll try to acknowledge when I'm not supposed to be. But if you think I'm supposed to be, kick me a note up. What is that that I just put in? I can see. Okay, that was an update upgrade because that one had been down for a while. Okay, exit this and now share this with you. That's weird, it's not full screen. I'm a little concerned about your ability to see it, but we'll see. So Scott's on the phone with the bosses. He can't tell me back channel if this looks good or bad. Heck, I'm just going to zoom in. We'll go from there. Uh, the problem with this zoom is I can't see the chat feed. So I'll try and check back with it now and again. The install is dead simple. If you're going to install on Windows, you've got to download a package, uh, expand it, and install it. It's not a big deal. To do it, uh, the install in Raspi or Raspberry Pi OS it's already in the repository. So let me show you this. It's really simple. Follow along if you like. sudo apt or apt-get if you like. Install GIMP. So this has never been done on this machine. Oh, are you going to do this to me? This is why I got to shrink it down because there's probably a yes or no that it's waiting for there. Yeah, I just hit the enter key. I changed the, uh, the resolution on here so you can see text, <clears throat> excuse me. But what I can't see as a result of this is the percentage completion. So I'm gonna shrink this a bit. There we go, now I can see it. All right, and hopefully you can see this. Uh, the downloading is complete, downloaded for 98%. Now we're installing it, 20%, 25%, goes pretty quick. I think when I installed this on my 3B yesterday, it took 55 seconds, give or take. And then, of course, the inevitable hangups. <laughs> All right, I'll come to head. Oh, 34, man, yeah, I'll still come back to head. We'll stop sharing here. And I'll fill you in as it goes. Shooting past 46% now. It, oh, brrr, blast, 95, 99%. Okay, we're going back to the share. Okay, so it's done. I don't need the terminal anymore. So where does it appear? What does it do? What's it look like? We go to the menu. We go to not sound and videos, graphics. And there it is, the GNU image manipulation program. Doesn't take too long to launch. See this querying new plugins? If you add a new plugin while GIMP is running, it won't work. What you have to do is shut GIMP down and then reboot it and it will find, <clears throat> excuse me, any of the new plugins. So let's bring up a, a file to edit. I'll file open and I'll go look in my folder. I put it in downloads or pictures. Yeah, I put it in here. So here's one of the moonshots that I took a while back. 
And let me do a little zooming on that. That's it. That's the zoom as it goes. See this black spot? That's from mold or dirt on the mirror. You saw that when I did this Astro Pride presentation. This one is two. This one is two. Now, GIMP has a built in tool to heal things like that. It's called the healing tool, amazingly. Uh, you can access it by simply uh, typing the letter H or going over here to click it. And it's kind of ugly. Let me zoom the picture in a little bit. So there's my handy dandy little horrible black spot. Yeah. And then what you do with this healing tool is we mark it and then you click or control click some area that you want to use to replace the texture of something that's bad. So I'm going to hold down my control button and I'm hitting click and everything that's in that circle just got copied. And now I release the control button and I just go click. And yeah, it left kind of some circle around there. So I'll click and spin around there. And now he's kind of replaced the texture of there. Notice that there's dark spots and light spots. And you know, that's okay when you're doing something very small. Now this is no longer the moon. This is something Dave's interpretation of the moon. Uh, so let me control Z and back out of this all bump, bump, bump. And to get rid of a, uh, a highlighted area, we control shift A. Yeah, what can you do there? Okay, close enough. All right, so that's the built-in tool. There is a better tool that comes with the thing, and it's called the synthesizer. I'm just showing you Dave's favorite tools here because this is going to relate to the next step, the plug-in. So I'm going to use my lasso here to mark out this area. It's really important when you're going to heal something that you mark outside the area that you want to heal. So I'm going way outside of this fuzzy dark area. And now I'm going to, well, it's, uh, here's the cool thing to show you. So now we're going to go into the, there's tools and filters, filters are tools. I'm going to go down here into map and I'm going to go into, hey, it's not there. So there is a tool that doesn't come with this thing. It's called the resynthesizer and nothing there to do with. There is also a better tool that when we get these in called the healing selection, heal selection tool. It's not here right now. So the best thing that I have to fix areas like this is the healing tool. It's okay, but it's not great, especially if you're working in bigger chunks of areas. So let me close this guy out all together. I'll close. Close all and exit this. Then I'm gonna come back and talk to you from head. Unshare that. Okay, so plugins. Plugins come in a couple of different flavors, and how you install them is different in a Mac, is different in Windows, and is different in Linux. I can't speak Mac. So in Windows, if I get a plugin, what I have to do is go look for them. They're not in a common place. Uh, but if you Google, for instance, heel selection, you'll find lots of people who have the heel selection. Uh, and you've got to go find that and you've got to go download it. It's a zip with four files in it, two Python scripts and two executable programs, EXEs. And you copy those to your machine and you unzip them. And then you copy the unzipped contents to a folder underneath your home folder. It's, uh, I don't know, users, DAVAR, app data, roaming, GIMP, plugins, if I remember right. Got to copy that into there and you're done. That add in is a plugin is now added. All you got to do is launch GIMP again and it'll be there. If after this, you want to go do plugins, manually, like I just described in Linux, and especially in Raspi, all of the tutorials are wrong. They tell you that you're going to copy the files that you need to a hidden folder. Let me take you over to where it could, would, should be. 
share friend. Okay, I'm there. So we do this. And this and this. All right, so what you would do is you would open up a terminal or use the, the file management tool. You'd go to your home directory. And if we do an ls minus a here, Stand by. LS minus, where are you? I have made notes and I do not see the notes I wanted. There was a switch that I used after this to make it a lot easier. Oh, there it is, it's G. Okay, so clear. LS minus A minus G. <clears throat> These are all the files and folders in this folder. And you can see these ones that start with dot. Dot folders are hidden. And all of the tutorials that tell you how to install plugins tell you that you will find a folder called dot GIMP in your home folder. Well, it ain't here. There's .gnup, there's .gconf, and those are the only two .g files. So what you have to do instead is go to, I want you to see it before I go there. There it is, .config. So let me do a clear screen here, and I'm going to cd space dot, oh, yeah, I'll do it that way, .config. And now I'm in this whole hidden folder. Wouldn't know it was there unless you did the right ls command. And here you can see there's a folder called GIMP, all caps. So I'm going to cd space GIMP. Remember, if you're new to Unix, everything is case sensitive. I type cd GIMP all in lowercase, it wouldn't get me there. We do an ls. Oh, we've got a version in here. So you can install multiple versions of GIMP in here. So cd 2.10. And here's a whole bunch of GIMP oriented menus, including one called plug dash ins. Really, there is LSP star. There it is, plugins down here. Should be alphabetically listed in here. Pair of, oh, plugins. Okay, so here's plugins. I'll go into that folder, CD plug dash ins. And there's nothing in there because I haven't installed. But this is what you would do. You would get Python scripts and executables that are executable in the Raspberry Pi OS universe. So it's got to be ARM-based, designed to run under RPI OS. And you would just copy them here and then relaunch GIMP. It would read this plugins folder, find the plugin, and integrate them. But. One of the really nice things is there has been created a collection of, let's call them the best, most commonly used plugins anywhere, including my favorite two, Resynthesizer and Heal Selection. And it's in an apt get repository. So all you got to do to get some of the coolest, most useful tools and filters is sudo apt install GIMP. Plugin registry. I'm doing that from memory. That was what was on one of my post-its before I started here. And we'll see if it fails. Of course, before you do this and before you install GIMP, you wanted to have done a sudo apt update and sudo apt uh, upgrade. Okay, we hit the buzz, buzz, grind, grind on that. Hey, it was right. Do you want to continue? This one takes less than a minute, but again, I'm going to come back to you while we're doing this. And then we'll fire up GIMP again and see what got added. And I'll show you how to use the resynthesizer and that. What I'd like you to do sometime in the meantime, I'm going to take you to uh, a place that explains everything that's in that registry. Oh, I know how to do it a good way. It's right there. No, it's not. It's here. It's Debian. OK, 
Okay, let me share this with you. Somebody sent me a back channel message, but I never got it. So whoever sent me a back channel message, if you're listening, uh, send it again or put it on the forum because I can't get there in short order. All right, this is a website. It's called, I got to move this because it's underneath one of my screen, packages.debian.org, wax SID, and then the name of that package we just did, gimp-plugin-registry. And this is a list of all of the tools and filters that are included in that installation. Uh, mention a couple of them here. Uh, built into here is the ability to export to a number of different file formats, graphical file formats that GIMP can't already do. Uh, where's the, the really cool one? Or, ordo, Ordo. There's a rescaler in here. There's a re-rasterizer in here. Here's resynthesizer. And I'll show that to you, explain what it is. There it is, traditional Orton. So this one's a really cool thing. If you shoot flowers, if you shoot landscapes or things like this, uh, and you run this filter on an image, what it does is it creates two images, one, a very sharp image of what you've already got there, and then the other, a fuzzy image of what you've got there, and then they overlay them and it gives it kind of a nice dreamlike quality. Great for landscapes, uh, fantasy things, things like that. So you can go check this out at your convenience, look it up in the archive, packages.debian.org slash SID, S-I-D, slash GIMP-plugin-registry. And it's the cool stuff, mama. All right, so let's go see what happened. Share. All right, so there it finished up. This one also takes about 45 seconds or so. Clear. And, oh, exit. Now let's relaunch GIMP. Graphics, GNU manipulator. These two programs, these two, they're called filters, kind of do the same thing. One of them is very old. It was developed in 2009. And what it does is it grabs information from beside at your choice, above and below, or all around something that you want to make disappear and get replaced by that background. It uses some level of artificial intelligence and uses that information to recreate the area that you want to disappear. The other one does the same thing, except it was developed a lot more recently, and it's bigger, stronger, better, faster. So let's take a look at that. File, open, and it remembers the last thing that I opened, so that's nice. All right, we'll zoom in on it. I'm going to use the plus key to do that. Ah, I got this scalar problem. I can go up and down, but my scalar is hidden. Let me go full screen, see if I can get to it. Nah, because of the way I've got this thing scaled so that you can see it, I can't get down there. So we'll work on this as it is. That's all right. <clears throat> And I'm going to lasso this again, like I did before, going a little bit beyond the black fuzziness. And now we'll go visit our filters friend, and we'll go to the map filters. Are you serious? Why can't I? I was able to see this before. Wow, I totally ticked somebody off. Shrink this. Filter. OK, leaving it shrunk down then. Map. No, I don't want to map the object. I want it in the map thing. Get out of there. Resynthesize. So this has now appeared. It's a new plugin. And if I just accept the defaults, we'll OK it. You can't see it. I can't see it. But down here on the bottom is a track bar 
that's moving on and it's resynthesizing this. And I think the last time I did it, it took, I don't know, for this much, two to three minutes. It takes a long darn time to do this. And when it gets done, we'll see this. I'm hoping, sure like to be able to get down to that lower menu. How can I change the scale on this? That didn't help. Don't want that, don't want that. Something happened on the image, but it didn't change where I was going with. Ah, well, that's what I get for being a nice guy, right? Let me check one more thing here. So there are some utilities where just lassoing it doesn't fix what you need to fix. And you have to double click within there. You can see this outline is now kind of wavy and wiggly. So let me go and try and see if I can hit that synthesizer again. No, no. I got to get to the menu to shrink this to the way I unshrunk it. And that's just going to be impossible. Fine. Let me uh, stop sharing for a second. Sorry, guys. It works on the RAS3. That's what I get for doing it on a machine that I wanted to show you fresh and no surprises. All right, shrink this. There we go. Okay, I'm getting there. All right, so I'm back to head right now. I'm going to re VNC that. Get a fresh connection going. And set the Resolution on here, fill screen with image. Okay. Fit image onto screen. All right, I'm good with that. But something's funny here. Something has changed where I can't shrink it back down to regular size. <clears throat> well, all right. I'm not going to abandon this for another two minutes. Then I will, because this should absolutely work. Picture quality, automatic, scaling, automatic. Let's change the scale here. 100%. All right, let me try something. Oh, okay, we'll try this. I'm getting all kinds of back channel messages. Let me see what they are. Back Dave Rush. Okay, Scott's here, jumping into Zoom, in and out. Yes. All right, we're sharing, we hope. Yeah, you're welcome to, Scott, by all means. Hey, we have it. So I don't know if you can see this. We'll give it a try. So I'm highlighted here. Now I'm going to go back into my filters. Back into map. Highlighted here. Now I'm going to go. Greetings, Scott and Echo. And resynthesize. We'll OK the defaults here. And now down here on the bottom, you can see this initializing. And it did almost nothing. Yeah, that all blackness is still there. I've done this on the other machine. It came up fine. But let me dive out of that. Back up everything that we've done up to this point. 
And now I'm gonna show you what I know works, the healing tool. So once again, eh, that's too big. We'll zoom this in. There we go. Send that up on the screen. Use my lasso to select the space. And you go, this one is so much more cool because you have a lot more control over it. And I'm going to double click inside there to select. So there's my selected area to work with. We filter, and this time we go to the enhance menu. Yeah. And you select heal from here. <laughs> I quit. Why can't I see that? Anti alias, data, high pass, noise res, sharpen, de speckle, de stripe, ML filter, wavelet. Did I close this after I did the. Let's make sure. I had to have. But I'm going to close GIMP and reopen it just to make sure it picked up the changes. Graphics, GNU. Oh, 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 this one is Python based. There's one more step I missed. Sorry, I can get back to that. We got to finish this. So after you install the GIMP plugin uh, registry, there is one more install that you have to do. This is the fiddliness that I was talking about earlier. It's really simple. It's really quick. Sudo apt install gimp dash python. This is a python driven utility. And while we have native python in there, we have to integrate gimp with python. Okay, it's done. Fire up gimp. That'll probably solve the other problem too, because that was new and Python based. Graphics, GNU, how are we doing on time? 42, I got time to illustrate them both. Illustrate, there's a pun there. Querying the new plugins. I just saw the PY happen, the, the Python add on. So that's cool. Okay, we'll open up our file to edit. Still remembers we were playing with this image. Nice. Use the plus key to zoom in. Center that up. A couple more pluses. That's enough. Okay, my lasso is already highlighted. I'm going to do this one large and sloppy. And I'm going to take you to that first one that I tried to show you that failed. Filter, map, resynthesize. And the defaults here will select various areas from outside the realm, this drawing, and then try to integrate it kind of like that heel tool that we saw, but in a much more intelligent fashion. There we go. See this synthesizer moving slowly. This is a very old, this is a 2009 program plugin. So it takes a little while, but I'm gonna keep you on here cause it's still, it's a third done. I'm not gonna come to head. I, on the other hand, I'm gonna poke my head that? in and say yeah, hi. How things going? <laughs> Good. 50%. And then when we get this done, we'll undo it. That happens just this quick. And then I'll show you the heal tool. Okay, so that's it. It's done. And what was a dark spot that looked like this now looks like this. So it's not a bad tool. Again, not great for really large items, but tolerable. Okay, let me get rid of that. There we go. Now I'm going to do the same exercise with the new cool, better, smarter healing tool. This is one of those ones that's too, too far outside. One more time. 
This is where I'm jealous of Michael. I totally missed that one over the beginning. He has this really good Wacom pen system that makes doing stuff like this so much better and easier than a mouse. Okay, I double click in there to select it into filters, enhance, and there it is. Heel selection now appears because we added that Python support. And I like this one because I get a lot more control over here. How many pixels outside of the selection do you want us to sample from? Do you want us to sample from all around, just from right and left, just from above and below? And then how do we fill in? So I want all around on this thing. And random works fine. Inward, outward, it's okay. And watch how quick, relatively speaking, that happened. Synthesizing, done. No leftover black marks. It just looks like moon. So that's my whole point about this exercise. Installing GIMP is easy. It's got lots of great tools already there for photo touching. But when it comes to really making it powerful and useful, it's all about the add-ons. And for that, you're either gonna have to find repositories or find the add-ons somewhere out on the web and copy them into that folder that I showed you. .config, GIMP, 2.10, plugins. All right, let me get out of this thing. Control Q, I think, quits out of here. Sure does. Unshare. And we're back. So that's the beauty of the beauty of GIMP. One, it's you can't beat the price. And <laughs> you know, it's like the fact that it's this powerful at free. I know, right? Yeah. Showing my colors. <laughs> my alma mater. Whenever I do anything like that really complicated, I gotta recycle my view here. So it's coming back now. All right, have you had a chance to uh, look through, see if there's anything we need to answer? We've got about 13 minutes to do it. I didn't see a lot of questions Good. that popped up. Um, so I prepped a, uh, a backup episode in case this happened too quickly. It didn't, it's kind of perfect, but it's really good because it's something that you and I talked about for a future episode. Mm -hmm. um, and the bones for it are already there in some of the flesh. Uh, Scott and I talked about a little while back after we did ca the Cali episode directly, there's a lot of demand for discussing the Kali tools. And Scott was thinking we'd pick a, a handful of them and sort of treat it like a, a Security Plus or a, a Pentest Plus segment. Right. And we just pick one episode and do a presentation on one of the tools. So I've, I've got one all prepped and ready to go for Nmap. I think that's going to make Alice happy because she's always poking on Mike. Nmap, Nmap, Nmap. So I got a short version of it uh, here ready to go. And anybody playing on Discord, I posted uh, what I'm going to do. You can redo that yourself without me to get it started. You'll see it when you get there. And otherwise, I think next week uh, or the week after, depending on what we're going to do on Black Friday here, uh, we're going to do an NMAP presentation. So coolness of foolness. Well, I think we should. I'll make an executive decision, Dave. Go, man, go. Let's do NMAP on Black Friday. Okay, and map on Bra Black Friday, Red Red. Black Friday. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so yeah. Good deal. We will see you here on Friday. All right, uh, I'm gonna check back here. What did we say? Uh, 245, I think, is where I left off. Uh, oh, it's in super scroll. <laughs> oh, 245, I can't even scroll back to anymore. There's a, a, a limit on these. When I go and did the indexes, I try to go back to the beginning sometimes and get notes. They drop off after so far. I'm going to go back to 318 yeah. right now. Uh, Brendan asked about, um, at 252, he asked about the inside of a switch. And oh. I know, right? <laughs> so is it similar to a Starbust topology? Actually, I answered that one while you were gone. You did? Okay. All right. Yes, cool. that one's covered. I, I, I checked out, unfortunately, because my boss called, as I mentioned, um, with a sad face. Very good. Yeah. Zoom, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just kind of zooming through. Pseudo app get $100,000. Yeah, there's a million awesome pseudo app get. 
Um, there's a, uh, a family circus uh, question, a cartoon that's been modified like that. Some kid says, can I have a cookie? And what's the magic word? Pseudo app get cookie. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, elbow no, um, that'll be a mic thing on whether we can actually get an FBI agent uh, to show up on camera. Um, <laughs> oh, that'd be so cool to have them behind a screen, but right. the video on the screen. <laughs> With the voice modulation. Driver. Yeah, exactly. Get a harmonizer <laughs> on them. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. Our government clients, uh, we, we do lots of classes or have in the past for the FBI, the DEA. Um, we've done classes at the United Nations. Um, you know, I did one, almost the last one that I did uh, in a four floor building where each floor was occupied by a different three letter enforcement agency. CIA <laughs> had the top floor and FBI had one and uh, Homeland had one. And that was fascinating because we had people from all four branches in there and the CIA people taught me things that's it's you know everybody says when you watch this csi stuff that's all bogus these are the guys who disprove that wow cool cool so yeah i was just looking on why i'm in a t-shirt so yeah yeah comfy cozy yeah. how's this sec plus going entire. andre's been been asking he posts every third minute uh, where are we at on Sec Plus? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on them. Okay, I'm working on them. Man. <laughs> and Kevin, Kevin, yes, the FBI is monitoring this conversation. Oh yeah. As soon as you say the word FBI. Yep. Straight feed. Yep. They monitor voting boxes too. <laughs> Passing 340. So I'm going to be getting close to the end here. You're at 340 already? Okay. Yep. Oh, uh, so hack5.org? Yeah. Is running a Black Friday sale. As Kevin pointed out, uh, the pineapple is on major sale. Oh, cool. Uh, if, you want, if you want a serious hacking tool and want to spend a few dollars, <laughs> uh, I posted the link in the chat. Um, so hack5.org. <laughs> H A K five. Right. Five, so yeah, like hey yeah. five. Cool. Thanks, Scott. And thank you, Kevin. Yep. Uh yeah, right. Anything that can't go wrong will go wrong. But my fault. I missed the step because I tried <laughs> to do it without notes. You know. Uh, pseudo app get GIMP works. Pseudo app get GIMP dash plugin dash registry. Adds stuff, but they don't all work until you do sudo apt install gimp dash python that's everything you need it's so it's so fascinating i mean it's like the the beauty of linux is that the tools are there the power is there and it's like you just have to like master the secret code to unleash it and huh. and suddenly it's like oh 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 that's all i did okay boom that's it, right? That's one of the things I was talking about. I think around the time you left, I, I love Linux. Not everybody does because it's fiddly. I love it because it's fiddly. You got to do stuff. He's going to keep troubleshooting through the evening. No way. I would have bailed. I would have switched over to my Nmap presentation. Gang colors. He's such a liar. <laughs> if he hadn't got it working, he would have kept troubleshooting all through the night. Yeah, right. I would have done it after the show. Sorry, I can't go to Discord. I got to do this. Yep. That is that is the way day rolls. <laughs> and everything gets done. Except yep. sleeping. Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, enjoy GIMP, man. It's, it's just useful as all get out, especially for somebody like me who's a dabbler. Scott is actually very good with Photoshop. He works intelligently with layers and all that stuff that's way beyond me. And Michael Smyer don't even get us started. He's a guru at everything, but 
he makes all the banners, you know, my, the mic banners that you see before we go live and the ones before me, those, that's all his work. Yeah, so the other thing about Michael Smyre, um, if you're flipping through the books and you're like, wow, these are really amazing photographs, uh, we get pushback on those from McGraw Hill when we submit the photographs because they're like, you need permission for this. I'm like, nah, Michael Smyre took it. <laughs> yep. Right, because he takes 47 pictures of the same thing. McGraw Hill gets picture number one, and then we got the other 46 that we can use. Once McGraw Hill gets a picture, we can't reuse it. It's now theirs and their rights, but Michael has it handled. Exactly, Dr. Quinn. Exactly. Like the Steve Kornacki with the elections on MSNBC. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are you at time, Mark? I'm, I'm at three. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm literally watching the live feed over on oh, okay. the monitor to the right. So uh, I'm at 340. Okay. We're pretty close here. The price really has the price of effort. Free. Right. There's nothing ever truly free. Yeah. That was a good comment. We use After Effects for my Photoshop needs. Okay. So, Scott. Yes, Dave. I, I did. I talked about Photoshop as a raster editor. I talked about uh, Illustrator as a vector editor. Mm -hmm. I cannot speak authoritatively to After Effects. What can you tell us about it? I put you on the spot. What our video production team uses for making cool video things. Oh, I yeah. Duh, right. It's a video editor. Okay. Yeah. I, I, After Effects is not something I use. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, okay. I'm, yeah. After Effects is used for adding effects into videos. Yep. Kind of like, yep, there you go. That's the okay. Have, I see you line here. We have we have four minutes left. Web dev boot camp. Ask a question. Yeah, which yeah, what's your question, Web Dev? Because ROM chips is almost nothing sexier. That's right. Cut my teeth on ROM chips right after I was done cutting my teeth on tubes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Vacuum tubes. Yeah, I know. I, I was there. Just making sure. <laughs> I, went, I went with. <laughs> yeah, I had to play that back in my head. Was that risque? Did I say something that could be misinterpreted? Yeah, what do you got, Web Dev? We got a couple of minutes here. I live in an old house in Houston, old for Houston. Um, and so my you walk up in my attic and, and the entire electrical system is what's called knob and tube, which means there are bare wires that handle all of the electricity in my entire house. No conduit, yep. knob and tube. So when he said, I chew tube, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's going to be electrifying. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know what his question is. So I'll do a quickie on ROM chips. Okay. A billion years ago when PCs were new and, and before that, there used to be this thing called a ROM chip. And it was a chip that's a memory chip that's programmed once. It's a read-only memory. So it's programmed at the factory with a BIOS setting or a program or whatever. And then once you plug it into a computer, that's all it ever has. The information that was burned in there from the very beginning. And BIOS chips were like that. Well, then it became necessary to update things like that. And the, the update that you had to do back then was uh, call factory and order an updated ROM chip. And for a ridiculously amount, a large amount of money, they would send you one. So they came up with an improvement. Uh, they switched to an erasable, programmable, read-only memory chip. Now, it wasn't something you could use at home. Uh, a vendor or somebody who had the right equipment would do this, but you would take this ROM chip that needed to be updated, and there was a little peel cover on top of it that covered the circuit, uh, which, was a, which was visible through a little piece of glass. And you would put that in a box that had a really powerful UV light and flip the light on and wait 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it was, and that would completely deprogram the chip, all zeros in it. And then you put it into an EEPROM programmer box and load the program that you want in there, and it would program the chip. That actually took a long time. That was 20 minutes to an hour to program a typical computer BIOS chip. But hey, cool, now you've got it. You put the, the seal back on it and plug it back into the computer. So I used to work for a company that made motherboards and people would send us back motherboards and we would update their BIOSes for a huge sum of money. Well, 
time and technology marches on and we've replaced that now with double E proms, electronic erasable, programmable, read-only memory. So we can send a, an electronic signal to the chip, deprogram it, and then send code to it to reprogram that. And that's what we use in computers today. So there's circuitry built on to the motherboard that can send the erase and reprogram content right to the BIOS chip. Oh gosh, it's on the hour, isn't it? All right, so I got my quickie in. Let me see if there's anything really important that popped up for the last minute, and then we'll do our shutdown. Web dev says he's gonna, over to, he's gonna he's gonna post a question on Monday. Okay, cool. Eating the two, oh, yeah. z, 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 what a pie hole block Spotify ads. Yes. Yeah, oh. go check uh, Reddit slash R slash pie hole without the dash. Uh, lots of people talk about killing Spotify ads. I'm thinking about going back to Mike's book and come back with the question. Okay. All right. Well, that's about it then. Uh, we'll see you on Discord in a few minutes. Uh, Scott's going to do his stuff that he needs to kill before then. I'll be there after I get changed. And as always, my eternal gratitude for you guys coming and joining us here. Can't wait till next week to do Nmap on Kali. That's a lot of fun. Uh, if you don't haven't, if you haven't installed Kali and you want to play with Nmap in the meantime, you can do it on regular Raspberry Pi, run a normal old RPI OS, sudo apt install Nmap, and you've got it and you're ready to play. It runs at about one seventh the speed under RPI OS as it does under Kali. I did some experiments on that this really? week. So wow. okay. yeah, it's really amazing. It's seven okay. seconds to All do. Right, so uh, next next yeah. Friday. It's still Black cool. Friday. Yeah. So we're doing that on Friday. Mike and will be here regular schedule on Monday. Thanks for coming in, Scott. And thanks for all your back channel work and everything. Sure. Jokes are up. Weekend? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Security I got the kid coming home Monday. So we're going to start getting ready for Thanksgiving. How fun. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Well, until right. then. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you on Monday and all through next week. Bye bye. Bye bye, Michael. And then we're going to leave this running five minutes just as an experiment